I wanted to start by focusing on today's first reading from the book of Genesis. We have the account of the fall or of Adam and Eve or just what happens right after the fall. And it's important that we realize that the fall of Adam and Eve impacts all of us. In other words, we are all born into this world separated from God. Now, in one sense, everything is connected to God somehow, but we are deprived of the presence of God. We are deprived of the grace of God, even though in Old Testament times, God occasionally gave uh, various graces to individuals, but there was this separation and there was this veil that prevented us from being able to make it to heaven. And a good way to think of this is to imagine the Garden of Eden as an, an enclosure. And had we been born inside the Garden of Eden, we would have received all the benefits that Adam and Eve had. But because Adam and Eve sinned, they were kicked out of the garden. They lost many of the benefits that they had within the garden, including their union with God. And because we are all born outside of the garden, it means that we inherit those losses. And one of those losses, of course, is this union with God. We lost that. We lost friendship with God. We lost, we lost also this inner harmony that we had that um, you know, enabled us to have self-control, self-mastery. So we have this inclination to sin, what we refer to as concupiscence. Now, notice how it mentions in Genesis 3.15, which we just heard in today's first uh, reading, God uh, speaking says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. So he's addressing the serpent. I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you shall strike his heel. And this is a very, very important passage, and it's important that we understand it. So in order for enmity to exist, so enmity means that you are sworn enemies, that there's great opposition between the two of you. Now, we could all say we're all at enmity with the devil. That's true, but in one sense, we're also in union with the fallen angels. Every time we sin, we are declaring our union with them. When we, com when we commit a mortal sin, we're not only declaring our union with them and rebelling against God in union with them, but we are, in a sense, united to them. They have greater influence over us in a, when we are in a state of mortal sin. So to, to have this true enmity between the devil and a human being, that human being would have to be free from the stain of original sin, free from this concupiscence that we all have. Because if we have this concupiscence, then we're prone to temptation. We're prone to attack. The evil spirit has greater influence upon us and fears us less. So for this enmity to truly exist, this woman that is being referred to must be like Eve was before her fall. In other words, she must be free from all sin. And of course, this woman is fulfilled in Our Lady. It's, it's a reference to Our Lady. She is the woman. And so today we celebrate the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the fact that she was conceived without any stain of sin whatsoever. And not only that, but she remained free of sin her entire life, not even the slightest venial sin. She did not commit. She was totally... Um, innocent of, of all sin throughout her entire life. And we might ask the question, well, why did God make her in this way? Was it just so that there would be enmity between her and, and the devil? No, it was because she was to be the mother of the Messiah, the mother of God incarnate. In other words, God was going to take his body from her body, and he wanted to ensure that her body was free from all, all stain of sin because God is perfect, and so he must have this perfect body. So if he's going to take his, his body from Mary, it also must be free of sin. And so uh, God did this, and, and so uh, Our Lady is immaculate, and theologians had difficulty with this. It was something that was 
uh, talked about quite often in the church, you know, Mary's sin, sinlessness, and have, because she's the mother of God, it makes perfect sense that she would be totally sinless. But the problem that arose was, well, if Mary is sinless, how can Christ be her savior? So in other words, even Mary needs salvation, even though she was, she was free from, from sin. And it was Duns Scotus, a Franciscan theologian, who pointed out that Mary was also in need of the grace of Christ, but it was a prevenient grace. In other words, in anticipation of what Christ would merit, it was applied to her in advance of his uh, passion and death on the cross. So she was preserved for this. And the analogy that is given is for most of us, it's kind of like uh, we've fallen into the pit. We need to be pulled out. We need to be saved. Mary, however, was, was not in the pit. And the analogy is that, you know, imagine somebody walking in the dark and they don't realize there's a pit in front of them. If they fall into the pit, we pull them out. We save them from being in the pit or falling into sin. In the case of Mary, it's as if someone prevented her from falling into the pit. So just because she doesn't need to be pulled out doesn't mean she wasn't saved from the pit. She was. So this is the argument that uh, Duns Scotus made, and of course it was accepted, and it was on December the 8th, 1854, that uh, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception was declared as an official dogma for all faithful Catholics to accept and, and believe. And just a few years later, in 1858, Our Lady appears to um, Bernadette Subaru in Lourdes, France. And if you recall, at the end of those apparitions, Our Lady reveals herself as the Immaculate Conception, kind of putting the stamp of approval on that papal decree that was made just a few years prior to that. So I mentioned that one of the reasons that God made Mary immaculate and free from all stain of sin was so that Christ could take his body from her, this pure body, but also so that she would have an immaculate heart to be the perfect mother for her divine son. So Mary is the perfect mother for her divine son, but not only that, so that she could be the perfect mother for each and every one of us, so that she could have this tremendous love for each and every one of us. So in other words, God wanted Mary to take on this role, not just being the mother of the Messiah, but for all those who will be brothers and sisters of Christ. So when we read in that um, passage from the book of Genesis, Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. So he will strike your head. In other words, it's like a mortal wound to the head of Satan. So he's defeated. But he, Satan, will strike his heel. In other words, he will slow down Christ. He will oppose Christ. He will impede his progress, but in the end, Christ is going to be victorious. But I wanted to draw your attention to the offspring. So it's singular, so it refers to Christ, but it, it could also refer to all of us because we are children of grace and all graces flow from Christ through Mary to all of us. So she's our spiritual mother. She has this perfect love for us. You know, imagine uh, when somebody hurts a mother's child. That mother would get angry. That mother would become defensive. That mother might even push that other child away. But Mary is not like that because she loves us. Even when we hurt her divine son through our sins, even because of our sins we crucified him, she still loves us because we are her spiritual children. So it's important for us to have this great devotion to Our Lady. And yes, there is this enmity between Satan and Our Lady. And interestingly enough, St. Louis Marie de Montfort points out that Satan and the evil spirits fear Mary more than they fear God. Not because Mary is more powerful. God is all powerful. Mary is just a lowly creature. Her abilities are very limited. They are finite. But the reason he fears her more than he fears God is because she participates in crushing his head, the head of Satan. So in other words, Satan could not get Mary to fall. 
Mary was totally obedient to God. Mary's obedience to God helps to undo Eve's disobedience. And of course, this is perfectly fulfilled in Christ. And this is why we can also say that Mary is co-redemptrix. Just a few announcements, very important announcements. This evening uh, at 6 p.m., the Legion of Mary will be conducting the Living Rosary in our parish. Everybody's invited to participate. This evening, because we have the Living Rosary, uh, we will not have exposition of the Blessed Sacrament and adoration. We will have the Mass as usual at 7.30 p.m. But I also wanted to touch on this devotion, devotion that is becoming more and more prevalent, more and more popular from year to year. And it's called the Hour of Grace. And if you haven't heard of it, thank goodness. But if you have, be very cautious. And it's, it's also referred to as the Rosa Mystica devotion. So this hour of grace, you're supposed to do this at 12 noon on this day. The Solemnity of the Immaculate Conception. And you're supposed to spend an hour with Our Lady, beginning with reciting the penitential psalm, Psalm 51, with your arms extended in the form of a cross, to recite this Psalm 51 three times. It's kind of a long psalm, so you, your arms are going to get eventually tired. And the ideal is that you do this in church, but if you can't, well, do it in your home and put away all distractions, turn off your cell phone. And if you do this with great devotion, no matter what request you make of Our Lady, it will be, you will be guaranteed to receive it. And as soon as you hear that, for any devotion, all kinds of red lights should come on. Because any devotion that promises to grant you your request, no matter how impossible it may be, is clearly not of God. And there are other reasons why this is not of God, this devotion. Now, to tell you the truth, when I first heard of this devotion years ago, I thought, oh, this sounds really good. This is something we should do. I even announced it in the parish, and we did it in the parish. And then I started, you know, finding out more information about it, and I realized it's not of God, but I wasn't sure. So I checked, I contacted the archdiocese, and they had all kinds of information that I didn't have, and they confirmed that this devotion is not of God. So either it's demonic in origin, or it's human in origin, and so we shouldn't do it. And if there's any possibility that it might be de demonic, we should definitely not do it. Now, would the demons, would the devil tell us to do devotions that honor Our Lady or reciting the Psalms? The answer is yes. So the demons tell us 99% good. Do 99% good. And with the 1%, they lead us astray. And it's important that we realize this. So what's some of the things that are wrong with this devotion or the origins of this devotion? And the claim is made that, well, the local bishop approved it and the popes have approved it, including Pope uh, Pius XII. False. All false. These are false claimants. And who is the father of lies? The devil. So these are all false. So what is the problem with this devotion? Well, it's not a church devotion. It's a private revelation that has not been approved. So if you're here at 12 noon doing this, well, you're going to be sticking out like a sore thumb. And such singularity isn't usually good. Our Lord tells us, you know, when you fast, you know, or, you know, hide it. Don't let people see that you are fasting. Don't let people see your penances. If it's public penance and everybody's doing it, okay, that's fine. That's a different matter. So it's going to cause a division with the community. Why are all these people holding their arms out in the form of a cross and praying away like crazy? Like, what's going on here? And not only that, you yourself will be more prone to pride. Oh, I'm doing this. I'm the only one. I'm doing something good for Our Lady. But you might be actually doing the work of the devil. So other problems with this devotion. Apparently, Our Lady Rosa Mystica revealed to the visionary that um, only a particular strain of wheat is to be used in the production of altar breads, because that's the only one that will be valid. Now, imagine that. So, in other words, the altar bread that we use at the Mass to consecrate the bread, well, it's made from wheat. And there's all kinds of strains of wheat out there. It doesn't matter as long as it's wheat. It has to be pure wheat and just water. That's what it's made out of. No additives whatsoever. 
But imagine somebody saying, well, only a particular strain found on this farm or this area of Italy, only that can be used. Well, that farmer's going to become extremely rich. But what's going to happen to the faithful? Oh, is that the right strain of wheat? If it's not, it's not really Jesus. It's not really the Eucharist. It's not a valid consecration because Our Lady Rosa Mystica said only this strain of wheat can be used. That's baloney. Um, there's, there's a few other things regarding this. And at one occasion, Our Lady told the, the visionary, the, the supposed Rosa Mystica, told the visionary, as a sign for everyone, what I want you to do is to go to the altar in the church and, and to lick in the form of a cross the four corners of the altar, the stone on the four corners of the altar. And that will be a sign to everyone that this is a true and authentic uh, vision or apparition, right? Well, if you lick the stone, nobody's going to see your lick marks. But it's like, it's kind of ritualistic. And part of the ritual is you, you do all these devotions and, you know, do this. And no matter what, it's guaranteed that whatever you request will be granted you. Uh-uh. The other thing is that, you know, today is Friday. And occasionally I'll mention, you know, Friday is a day of abstinence. It's a day of penance. But today is a solemnity. It's a feast day. We're supposed to celebrate. We're supposed to indulge. We're supposed to have a feast. It's not a day of penance like this. You know, imagine somebody saying, well, you know what? During the season of Lent, I'm going to indulge in chocolates and all those things. And then when you guys celebrate Easter, that's when I'm going to fast and do all those things I'm supposed to do during Lent. Like we would think that person is a little cuckoo. Same as with the church calendar. Okay, so traditionally people would fast the day before a great feast. That's okay. But on the feast day itself, you indulge. So today, if you normally would fast, well, no, you shouldn't fast today because it's a solemnity. God wants you to rejoice. Our Lady wants you to rejoice. Not to get sore arms, not to be doing penance. So I find this very upsetting because it's a great dishonor to Our Lady. It's a great dishonor to the celebration of this feast. And you're potentially following a demonic, demonically inspired apparition or revelation. And you're encouraging others to do it also. So please don't do that. So yes, I am very concerned about this. So I felt I had to, to um, say a few words about that. Thank you.